Thank you very much. Can everybody hear? Okay, good. Uh, that was a lovely introduction, and I thank you. Uh, I have a paper which, if I were to read it in its entirety, would take more than the 60 minutes which uh, Professor Spade has generously allowed me. So I'm not going to read it in its entirety. Uh, I'm going to read parts of it and summarize parts of it. Uh, and I'll try to get finished by 6 o'clock. Uh, I suppose some people may find provocation in my title. I imagine someone saying to himself, what Christian case against religious liberty? You must have Christianity confused with some other religion. Christianity is unequivocally in favor of religious liberty. After all, for its first three centuries, Christians were a persecuted minority in the Roman Empire who had to fight for the right to practice their religion without interference. Moreover, Christianity's founder, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, uh, was an advocate of nonviolence who taught us to love one another, to do unto others as we would have them do unto us, and to turn the other cheek. Nothing could be further from the true spirit of Christianity than persecution in the name of religion. So it may be said. So, in fact, it often has been said by people like Sebastian Castellio and John Locke and Thomas Jefferson. And yet, historically, Christians have not had a good record in this area. So a recent historian of Christianity has written that for most of its existence, Christianity has been intolerant, the most intolerant of world faiths, doing its best to eliminate all competitors uh, with Judaism qualified exception. Now, I'm not competent to make the comparative uh, judgment Dylan McCulloch makes in the passage just quoted. Uh, I don't know which of the world faiths is the most intolerant of other faiths, but I do know that when they've had the positions of power, Christians have often refused to tolerate not only members of other religions, but also uh, members of their own religion who descended from the dominant interpretation. We need to under try to understand how this could be when there is so much in Christian teachings which seems to go against it. Uh, and we need to understand what the Christian case against religious liberty is before we can evaluate the counter-arguments. Uh, okay. In this paper, I'm going to be arguing that contrary to what you might have expected, there actually is a way within the framework of Christian principles to justify using state power to enforce Christian belief. I don't claim that what I'm calling the Christian case against religious liberty is conclusive, or one which all Christians are obliged by their faith to accept. I certainly hope the Christians who might be in this audience won't accept it, but it does seem to me that the case is uncomfortably strong. That's not a cheery fact for a non-believer like me, but I think it's one we need to acknowledge if we're going to respond effectively to the case for coercion. In the book I've got in progress, I consider the work of four theologians who undertook to make that case, Augustine, Aquinas, Martin Luther, and John Calvin. These were men of great ability, learning, and influence. I don't think their understanding of Christianity can simply be dismissed out of hand. In this paper, I'll limit myself primarily to Augustine. After I've laid out what I take to be his central argument, I'll consider what can be said against it. I'll argue that the kind of moderate response you find in Locke, though very popular, is inadequate, and that Spinoza showed the way to a better response. But first, Augustine. It's no accident, I think, that the first major Christian theologian to argue for the use of force against heretics is also the first major Christian theologian to argue quite generally that it's permissible for Christians to use force for a variety of reasons. This was not obvious. After all, some of the teachings of Jesus do lend themselves readily to a pacifist interpretation. So on the, in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus is reported as saying, and this, I assume this passage is so familiar that I don't need to read it, I'll just flash it up there. Most of those who seek to follow Jesus in other respects have not followed him in this one. Not if you take this teaching to require abstaining completely from the use of force or violence. Some have done that, Tolstoy, Martin Luther King, but most haven't. 
And Augustine seems to have played a significant role in determining how Jesus' teachings on this point were taken by subsequent generations of Christians. Augustine wrote at a time when pagans still constituted a significant minority of the population, and some of his letters are concerned with answering their criticisms of Christianity. In one letter, he writes to Marcellinus, a Christian friend who occupied a position of authority in the Roman government of North Africa, and had written to ask how he should reply to pagans who claimed that the teachings of Christ were inconsistent with their duties as Roman citizens. Could you be a good Roman, for example, if you were not willing to fight in the army which was resisting the barbarian invasions? Augustine replied that what was crucial from a moral point of view was the intention with which you acted. If you strike the man who has struck you from a desire for vengeance, that's one thing. If you strike him with the intention of correcting him, that's another. Sometimes forbearance will be the best way to teach the wrongdoer not to do wrong. Under those circumstances, you should turn the other cheek. But often, wrongdoers need to be set straight with what Augustine describes as a certain benevolent harshness. As a parent who loves his child might nevertheless use severe punishment to correct him. Their utility is to be consulted, not their will. I won't read the rest of that quote. Augustine will allow a variety of considerations to override the recommendation against the use of force. If a man is attempting to rape a woman and another man is able to prevent the rape by killing the attacker, he may do so. So it seems, may the woman herself. Then we have this quote, the law gives license to lesser wrongdoings among the people it governs so that the greater ones might not be committed. This line of thought leads naturally to a defense of killing in war. What is it about war which is to be blamed? Well, it much depends on the intention with which you're doing it. I'm not going to read the whole of this quote, but I do want to call attention to one thing in particular, and that is the suggestion that sometimes wars might be undertaken at God's command. One of the, Augustine is writing to a Manichaean here, and one of the complaints the Manichaeans had about Catholic Christianity was that the, they didn't think the God of the Old Testament was such a decent fellow. Uh, in particular, he was apt to command genocidal wars. And uh, Augustine needs, among other things, to try to reconcile some of these teachings of the Old Testament with the teachings of the New. Uh, okay. Now, I don't want uh, at this point to get into the question whether this is the best interpretation of the apparently pacifist passages in the Sermon on the Mount. All I'll say for now is that Augustine's interpretation appears to have had a significant influence on the subsequent development of Christian moral teachings, and that if a theory of this general kind had not been become the dominant interpretation of the teachings of Jesus, it seems unlikely that Christianity would have gained as many adherents as it did. Those sects within Christianity which have insisted on a pacifist interpretation of Jesus' teachings have had more admirers than followers. Although Augustine seems to have concluded fairly early in his career that certain purposes would justify the use of force, he did not initially favor using the imperial power to support the version of Christianity he accepted. In one of his letters, uh -oh. Uh -oh. Ah, okay. You have this quote, which represents what his uh, original opinion had been that uh, we should use reason and argument as opposed to force. So Augustine was for toleration before he was against it. Later I'll come back to his reasons for opposing the use of force in religion, but I want to look at the argument which led him to change his mind first. Most of Augustine's writings on toleration arose out of the problem of dealing with the Donatists, 
a sect which had begun in the early fourth century in North Africa in a controversy over the ordination of a bishop in Carthage by a bishop who had surrendered copies of the scriptures to the Roman authorities during the Diocletian persecution. The Donatists argued that a priest who had failed in his duty in that way must not have the Holy Spirit in him and so could not validly perform the duties of a priest. Someone who was not in a state of grace could not administer a valid sacrament. It may seem that unlike other disputes in this period, such as the battle over the Trinity, this controversy did not involve matters of basic Christian doctrine, but in a way it was more fundamental. It concerned the qualifications for office of those clergy who were responsible for defining Christian doctrine in the first place. To many, the Donatists seemed to set an unreasonably high standard for holding that office. I think the subsequent history of the church has proven the wisdom of that position. Uh, however that may be, Augustine had a deep awareness of human sinfulness. I don't think he ever had any doubt that the Donatists were wrong. But that still left the question of what to do with them. Should Catholic Christians, that is, in this context, the party that was numerically and politically dominant among Christians at that time, rely on words, arguments, and reason to convert the Donatists? Or should they, if rational persuasion failed, as it was sometimes bound to, use the imperial power to settle the dispute? What, Augustine asked, does Christian love do in this case? What does brotherly love do? Um, and I'll leave you to read the rest of that quote for yourself. And I take it that Augustine is making an argument which we might spell out as follows. First of all, Christianity requires us to love our fellow men. This, I think, is uncontroversial. Second, love requires that we show in our actions an appropriate concern for the well-being of those we love. Now, in some interpretations of what constitutes an appropriate concern, this premise might be controversial, but to avoid controversy, I propose to interpret the language modestly. I don't claim that if we love someone, we must always be doing whatever we can to improve that person's well-being. If my granddaughter is doing fine, then I think it's consistent with my love, loving her to let well enough alone. But if she's in trouble, or perhaps doing something which could lead to disaster, then it would be inconsistent with genuine love for me to stand idly by and let things take their course. When Augustine asks what love requires, he seems to be contemplating situations in which the person you're supposed to love is threatened with disaster. So in one of his letters he writes, and uh, here we have uh, a characteristic example. He has others of a similar sort. You see somebody out of his mind who's running toward a cliff. Should you prevent him from going over the cliff or not? And Augustine thinks that you would be doing him a favor to prevent him, even though it might seem that you were, certainly you're thwarting his will at the time. Now, if we understand love as requiring at least disaster avoidance, not necessarily strenuous efforts to improve an already satisfactory situation, I think the second premise ought to be uncontroversial. The next step is that uh, Sometimes acting for someone else's well-being requires us to do things which in the short term are harmful to that person, though in the long run they will benefit him, all things considered. Uh, this too, I think, ought to be uncontroversial. Once when I presented an earlier version of this paper, someone quoted St. Paul to me, we may not do evil that good may come, I don't know what Paul meant by that, but if he meant to exclude uh, such a commonplace principle as three, then he was excluding quite a lot of what we ordinarily think it perfectly reasonable to do. Uh, not just using force to restrict people's liberty, but also using force to correct wrongdoers or to punish children. It would apparently rule out forcing your terrified child to have a tetanus shot or to submit to a dentist. Uh, 
if Paul meant to rule out such things as that, he was just wrong. The next step was certainly uh, uncontroversial among the Christians of Augustine's day. I think it's been uncontroversial for most of the history of Christianity. This is an assumption about salvation and damnation. We all face one or the other, and one is infinitely good, the other is infinitely bad. Augustine clearly believes that there's an eternal reward awaiting all who meet God's conditions for salvation, whatever those are, and eternal punishment awaiting those who don't. It's unsurprising that he believes this, given the scriptural support for these doctrines in the New Testament. From these assumptions, Augustine concludes that someone who genuinely loves his neighbor will do what he can to procure his neighbor's salvation and help him avoid damnation even if this requires doing things which in the short run are harmful to his neighbor, harmful at least in the sense of thwarting his will. So far this argument would seem to require at least vigorous evangelism, but nothing in it yet requires coercion. Uh, the uh, rationale for drawing that conclusion emerges in what follows. Augustine assumes that achieving salvation requires having correct theological beliefs, including specifically Christian beliefs about Jesus. This is what we now call exclusivism. I think it's a pretty traditional Christian assumption, which appears to be solidly grounded in familiar New, Con New Testament texts. There's the clearest of them, I think, and I won't read it because I assume that it is very familiar to most, if not all of you. I take it that the belief in Jesus which this text speaks of, and the kind of belief Augustine would think necessary for salvation, is something more than simply the belief that Jesus was a great teacher and a model whom we should imitate in our actions. It involves at least the belief that Jesus was the Son of God, sent by his Father to redeem the world through his sacrificial death. That is, the kind of belief which Christians have endorsed for centuries when they recited the Nicene Creed. From five, the assumption that loving your neighbor requires you to do your best to procure his salvation and help him avoid damnation, even at some short-term cost. And from six, the assumption that correct theological beliefs about Jesus are necessary to achieve salvation and avoid damnation, it follows that Someone who genuinely loves his neighbor will do what he can to ensure that she has those correct theological beliefs. Let's stipulate what I'm sure Augustine would cheerfully concede, that the preferred way of bringing about that your neighbor has correct theological beliefs is friendly persuasion. But let's also grant what seems an inescapable fact of life, that friendly persuasion doesn't always work. So the next step in the argument is to say that doing your best to ensure that your neighbor has correct theological beliefs may sometimes require using force. From seven and eight, Augustine would conclude that Christian love sometimes requires us to use force against our neighbors to ensure that they have those correct beliefs. I don't claim that Augustine ever laid this argument out as fully and clearly as I've tried to do here, uh, but I do claim that this reconstruction of his argument captures his intentions pretty well insofar as we can infer them from his correspondence dealing with this issue. And I also claim that for those who accept its Christian assumptions, it's a pretty strong argument. Strong but not invulnerable. In the uh, remainder of this paper, I want to consider two possible ways, lines of criticism. One moderate from a philosopher who pretty much accepts the Christian assumptions of the argument, but rejects Augustine's conclusion. And the other, a more radical uh, response which rejects the Christian assumptions, or at least one of them. My moderate philosopher is John Locke. Now there's some, there's much room for disagreement about the exact nature of Locke's religious beliefs. Uh, he was in some ways clearly an Orthodox Christian. 
Uh, he believed that the existence and attributes of God were demonstrable. Uh, he believed that revelation justifies a confidence approaching certainty regarding uh, the availability of heaven for those who are righteous. Uh, and he was an exclusivist. He, not, I think, entirely in agreement at this point with Augustine because I think he sought to minimize, uh, or minimize, I guess is the word I want, the, uh, the amount of theological belief that you would have to have in order to be saved. But uh, he, he did think that you couldn't accept the divine origin of the Christian scriptures without at least uh, accepting the proposition that Jesus was the Messiah. Uh, that's less meaty theologically than uh, what I think Augustine would have thought was necessary. But in some ways, uh, Locke is, is not very orthodox. Uh, so he has doubts about eternal punishment. He thinks there will be an afterlife in which the wicked will be punished, but he doesn't think it's going to happen to eternity. He seems to reject original sin, and he apparently rejects the doctrine of the Trinity. It's a little difficult to tell about some of these points because he's very cagey about expressing himself openly, and of course, uh, the conditions of the time, uh, I mean, Denying the doctrine of the Trinity was a capital offense in England at this time. Um, so, uh, okay, so Locke is um, unorthodox enough to stand in need of a broader toleration than his society afforded. I think it was probably prudent of him not to put his name on the title page of a work he wrote in the 1690s called The Reasonableness of Christianity. Uh, but he's also orthodox enough that it's not clear what Christian teachings he might reject in the Augustinian argument for intolerance. What would he reject in that argument? Um, not any of the specifically Christian assumptions of, of the argument, I think. Um, at least not as I've formulated them. Um, I, I put this in the subjunctive because so far as I can tell, um, Locke never actually considered uh, any of the Augustinian writings in which Augustine had made this case. Um, the, uh, and he's, when he writes on toleration, ex I mean, except in so far as he's responding to Prost, um, he, he t tends not to be very specific about who his opponents are. Um, but it, it seems clear that, given the argument as I've laid it out, the thing that he would focus on would be the assumption that coercion can lead to a saving faith. Uh, so here's a quotation from the letter on toleration, the first letter. The magistrate's power consists wholly in coercion, but true and saving religion consists in the inward persuasion of the mind, without which nothing has any value before God, and such is the nature of the human intellect that it cannot be compelled to the belief of anything. That's an addition from Locke's 17th century translator, but I think it's a reasonable addition, by outward force. Confiscate a man's goods, imprison or torture his body. You act in vain if you wish by these punishments to change the judgment of the mind concerning things. Now this kind of argument, which I'll call the appeal to the necessary ineffectiveness of coercion, has been extraordinarily popular in the debate over religious liberty. You find it in Roger Williams, you find it in Bale, you find it in Jefferson and Madison. But I think its popularity exceeds its merit. As I understand it, Locke's argument assumes, first, that believing is not the kind of thing we can do at will. Uh, we cannot decide to believe something in the way that we can normally decide to raise one of our arms. And second, that only things that we can choose or decide to do are susceptible to the positive 
and negative incentives implicit in a situation where we are responding to a command. From this, Locke concludes that belief is not the kind of thing which can be commanded and that any attempt by the state to use its coercive powers must be in vain. Now, I agree with one important qualification with the premise that belief is not under the control of the will and therefore not an action that a person can perform on command or in response to threats of punishment for not believing. But the qualification is important. Belief is not under the direct control of the will. Though we may not be able to believe at will, there are things we can choose to do which may definitely affect what we believe. We can choose to expose ourselves to a particular religious teaching, say by attending church regularly. We can choose to read books which argue for the truth of that religion and not to read other books which might raise questions about it. We can choose to associate only be with believers and shun non-believers. Since these are all things we can choose to do, they are also things someone can command us to do, things which the threat of punishment for disobedience can motivate us to do. This psychological point should be familiar to us from Pascal's wager argument. Earlier, I quoted a letter from Augustine in which he explained his initial resistance to the use of imperial power to suppress the Donatists, partly by his concern that it might yield only a pretended acceptance of Catholic Christianity. We might have, he said, as false Catholics, those whom we had known uh, to be obvious heretics. This must always be a concern whenever force is used to promote any kind of orthodoxy. But Augustine reports um, that the result was not the one he had feared. 